Hey folks, good afternoon. My name is Angelique Palomar. I am the Communications Associate for the Institute for College Access and Success, uh, better, better known as TICUS. I uh, just want to thank you all for joining our webinar today in partnership with SSCCC. Uh, Laura Zabo-Kubitz, TICUS's Associate California Program Director, will discuss the California College affordability landscape and how student leaders, such as yourselves, can help influence policy decisions on behalf of our state's 2.1 million California community college students. Uh, but before handing it off to Laura, I wanted to flag for our viewers the Q&A button. Uh, please feel free to use that for any questions throughout the presentation and Laura will answer as she sees fit. Otherwise, we'll hold the Q&A portion uh, at the end of the session. Uh, without further ado, Laura, go ahead and take the stage. Terrific. Well, thanks everybody for joining the webinar this afternoon. I hope everyone is staying um, safe and healthy and your families are as well. Uh, <clears throat> and I also hope that the um, General Assembly um, that was done remotely went well this weekend. I, I also was really bummed out that I couldn't be down in, um, in Ontario, California to be there. I've been at the General Assemblies, um, I think every single one you've had since 2008. So. Um, so that was just, uh, disappointing, but nonetheless, very glad that all of you have been able to um, to join this afternoon. So I am um, going to give the presentation that I was planning on giving in person. And as Angelique just said, you know, feel free to ask questions as I go along. And if there's a natural break in um, the um, portions of the PowerPoint, I will happily answer those questions. Otherwise, we can answer them at the end. Okay. Oh, I don't know why this is not, there we go, sorry. A little uh, tech issues. Okay, <laughs> so for those of you who may not be familiar with TICUS or the Institute for College Access and Success, we are a higher education policy nonprofit that focuses on college affordability and accountability, both nationally and in California. Uh, we do work to increase awareness and reduce the burden of student loan debt, improve access to available grant aid, and in particular, strengthen need-based grant programs. And we also do work around protecting students, borrowers, and taxpayers. Uh, and, you know, so when I started this work over a decade ago, there was um, a ton of focus on the impact of financial aid on college access, which of course is very important. Uh, in order to be able to enroll in college, you need to have um, the, the resources to pay the tuition. Um, but increasingly, there's been the understanding that equally as important is financial aid to help pay for non-tuition costs that allow us students to be successful. So do we have enough financial aid to be able to have, pay for our transportation to get to school, to buy the required books and supplies, um, having a safe roof over our heads and nutritious meals? Um, so we focus both on the importance of financial aid for college access and success. The next couple of slides I wanted to provide um, some snapshots of the college affordability landscape in California. Uh, so what you'll see here is the uh, East Bay and uh, what we're looking at are the three public colleges and universities. So Berkeley City College, um, CSU East Bay, and then um, uh, UC Berkeley. And what you can see here uh, is that while the tuition and fees um, differ considerably across the three institutions, non-tuition costs are much more similar. And thus, uh, when you look at total college costs, uh, it is actually not as different to attend a community college as it is to attend a public four-year university. Now, you may have heard of folks talking about net college costs, which is when you take the total college cost, so on the previous slide at Berkeley City College, the total college cost there would be uh, $20,000. Um, and then you subtract the grant aid that a student gets. So here you can see that um, average grant aid um, does differ quite significantly, significantly across the segments. And that when you look at the average grant aid that students are receiving in these three colleges, it's actually quite less at the community college, which means that the net college costs or what students have to pay out of pocket through savings, work, or borrowing loans is actually higher at the community college. And this is, just, this is not just a one-off case. When we look across the state of California, we see that uh, consistently it is 
more expensive for a low income student to attend a community college than it is to attend a public four year university. I know it's a little bit um, teeny on the screen, but the main takeaways from this chart or this, this map are that, um, well, I'll take a step back. So first, what we did for our methodology was we looked at the nine undergraduate serving UCs across the state and we paired them with their local Cal State University and community college. We then went to their net price calculators, which all colleges are required to have. And if you haven't um, looked at one yet, I encourage you to, to look up the one for the school or the school you attend. But essentially, you can enter in your financial information, and then it will tell you that a similar student received you know, roughly this much in aid, so you can expect to have to pay roughly this much out of pocket. So we did that for all 27 colleges um, in this analysis, and we found that consistently um, community college students received um, disproportionately smaller aid packages and therefore had to pay um, a lot more out of pocket. Now that said, in all 27 colleges across the state, um, students have to work um, more than 15 to 20 hours per week to cover their out of pocket costs after grant aid. So even at um, CSUs and at the UCs where net costs are generally lower, they are still high enough that students are having to work much, far too much um, than is um, appropriate in order to be a successful student. We also know that um, these affordability challenges um, are really, um, they put disproportionate burdens on lower income students and students of color. So students who come from families that make less than $30,000 a year in income have to spend about half or even more of their income to pay for college costs after grant aid. Um, that's compared to approximately less than one quarter of family income for students in other income groups. And this has real equity implications. Uh, more than half of Latino, three in five Native American, and almost two thirds of African American students come from families with incomes less than $30,000 a year. So I'm gonna just pause for a second and check to see if anyone had any questions and I'm not seeing any at the moment. Uh, let me check the chat as well. Okay, so I'll keep, I'll keep going. So um, the, then the next question is, well, okay, well, what is, what are the underlying reasons for why we are um, seeing these uh, major affordability issues. Now in California, the main need-based financial aid program is the Cal Grant program. And the, you know, it's, it's a pretty complex program that has developed different types of, of, of you know, sub-programs over the years. But the sort of easiest way to explain it is, or to think about it is um, first thinking about the eligibility pool. So if you are a recent high school graduate and you apply by the March 2nd deadline, and this is assuming you meet the basic uh, eligibility requirements of having a minimum GPA and not exceeding a certain maximum income threshold, you are entitled to a Cal Grant. You will get one. However, if you are more than one year out of high school or say you um, are a recent high school graduate, but you went to an under-resourced high school where there weren't enough counselors and you weren't aware of the application deadline, you have to compete for a very limited number of competitive Cal Grants. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now within both Cal Grant, I'm sorry, within both entitlement and competitive eligibility pools, there's Cal Grant A and Cal Grant B. I'll also note there's a separate Cal Grant C program for career technical education it's a pretty small program. It's less than 8,000 awards per year. Now, um, community college students uh, benefit from the Cal Grant B program, which provides up to four years of an access award to help pay for non-tuition costs. Community college students don't get Cal Grant A because tuition and fees are already waived by um, the Promise Grant, formerly known as the BOG fee waiver. And then the amount that the student get is based on where the, the student goes to school. Again, at the community colleges, um, because Cal Grant recipients there only get the access award, that is the um, up to $1,672 to help pay for non-tuition costs per year. 
Here, um, what we are looking at is the distribution of college students throughout California, as well as the distribution of who's getting Cal Grants, and then um, in both the number of awards, and then also in terms of the dollar amount. So what you can see here uh, in the first ring on the left is that of all college students in California, two thirds attend community college. So one would think that if they, um, uh, awards and dollars were dispersed evenly, we would also see that about two thirds of Cal Grants went to community college students and two thirds of dollars do. Um, however, that's not the case. In fact, uh, a little bit, a little less than a third of the Cal Grant awards go to community college students and just 7% of Cal Grant dollars go to community college students. So we can see here that these dollars are not distributed um, evenly. And I know that, sorry, we uh, a couple of formatting issues, but hopefully uh, you can see on this slide um, one of the most important takeaways, which is uh, has to do with competitive Cal Grants. I mentioned a few slides back that there are two competitive pools, one of them being the entitlement program, one of them being the competitive program. And what you can see here is that there are far more eligible applicants than there are available comp competitive Cal Grants. So, in the 2019-20 academic year, we had over 300,000 eligible applicants um, for only 41,000 available competitive Cal Grants. And I'll note as well that the vast majority of these competitive Cal Grant awards are community college students. Also, the majority of eligible applicants who don't get an award because not enough are available are living in poverty. So, this is one of the reasons why we're seeing the disproportionate um, distribution. Uh, and in other words, this is one of the reasons why we're seeing that community college students are not getting as large a share of the Cal Grant award pie as we would expect. And that's because many are in the competitive Cal Grant pool, but unfortunately, even though they are eligible, they're not getting a Cal Grant because not enough competitive awards are available. Another issue, and again, apologies for some of the um, little bit wonky uh, formatting here, is that the Cal Grant B Access Award, which is the type of Cal Grant that community college students receive, um, the, the value of that award unfortunately continues to stagnate. Now, when the Cal Grant program was created in 1969, that award was worth $900. Had that award kept pace with inflation, it would be worth about $7,000 today, which means that the actual maximum, which is just under $1,700 today, is actually less than a quarter of its original value. Now, I do wanna note that for community college Cal Grant recipients who attend full-time, they can get up to an additional $4,000 a year to help pay for non-tuition costs, which is great. However, because many of our community college students don't receive a Cal Grant in the first place, and many of those who do unfortunately aren't able to attend full time, this means that fewer than 5% of our California community college students can qualify for this additional supplemental award. So when you combine, uh, as I said on the previous screen, the fact that the vast majority of eligible competitive Cal Grant recipients are at community college and that they're not getting a Cal Grant in the first place, and you combine that with the issue that for those who are uh, fortunate enough to get a Cal Grant, the value has um, substantially declined. That's why we're seeing, and I'll pop back, that's why we're seeing on this screen that only 7% of Cal Grant dollars are going to community college students. We see that in the ring chart on the right hand side. So in summary, the key structural problems that we have with the current Cal Grant program are that while it does well helping recent high school graduates cover tuition costs, does not do nearly as well helping older students, and by that I mean even people just one year out of high school, um, nor does it do a good job helping us pay for non-tuition college costs, you know, including living expenses that are, um, uh, we rely, rely upon in order to be successful students. And as should be no surprise to all of us on the call, these affordability challenges um, stretch far and wide and they impact student debt levels, student completion, time to completion and degree, and contribute to equity gaps. 
So again, I want to just take a moment to pause and check and see if we have any Q&A or chat, and I'm not seeing any, so I will continue. So the implications of insufficient need based aid. Um, well, first of all, we know that students, in particular at community colleges, um, may work excessive hours. You'll recall the net price map that we looked at towards the beginning of the presentation showed that um, at all 27 colleges, including community colleges, UCs and CSUs, students would have to work more than 15 to 20 hours a week to cover their costs, college costs after available grant aid. And we know from a wide body of research that working more than 15 to 20 hours a week can be quite detrimental to student success. Um, in fact, at three quarters of the colleges in that analysis, uh, well, I'm sorry, and I think that was uh, mostly community colleges, low-income students would have to work more than 20 hours a week to cover college costs. It also contributes to low rates of full-time attendance. Again, we know that students who are able to enroll full-time are more likely to be successful. And at all of the community colleges in that net price map analysis, the majority of students attend part-time. The weekly work hours at the community colleges to cover those net costs range from 27 to 42, as high as 42 per week. So, um, it should therefore not be a surprise that this impacts our community college students' ability to enroll full-time when they have to work so much. And then it also, uh, these affordability challenges also impact student borrowing. Now, small shares of community college students borrow, um, but some still do. And we also have done research looking at the debt burdens of CSU and UC students, and we have found that they disproportionately affect low-income students and students of color. So for example, <clears throat> while um, overall half of, approximately half of CSU and UC bachelor's degree recipients had borrowed student loans, two-thirds of UC graduates and three-quarters of CSU graduates who are African-American had borrowed, borrowed student loans. We have two reports on our website if you're curious to learn more about this. Um, one is called um, when, uh, when Debt Comes Due at CSU, and then the other is called First Comes Diploma, Then Comes Debt. And while these are focused on CSU and UC students, I know many community college students transfer to the public four years. And so, um, you know, these uh, um, are, you know, potentially your, your, your peers as well. So what are we doing to address these issues? Well, back in 2012, PECAS formed Californians for College Affordability, which is a diverse coalition of higher education advocacy, social justice and civil rights, all three statewide student leadership groups and business and workforce organizations that are united in strengthening need-based financial aid in California. You can see from our the snapshot of our postcard here that both the SSCCC and the, it's a quite small logo, but the Student um, Trustee Caucus also of the SSCCC are members. And I'm very proud to say that the SSCCC is an original member since 2012. And as I just mentioned, also CSSA and UCSA are, are members as well. So together we have been working over the years to increase both the Cal Grant B Access Award, which helps our low income students limit their work hours and focus on their studies by getting uh, access awards to help pay for non-tuition costs. And we're also been working to serve more of the state's Cal Grant eligible students. And this, um, this work has been really, um, really great to be able to partner with such a diverse uh, membership. It also helps students across all types of colleges and all program types. Uh, it prioritizes our students by financial need. Um, it you know, improves college access and completion rate. So again, the focus has been both increasing the number of low and middle income students who get Cal grants and then also the amount that they receive. Now, uh, I will chat, pause again to just see if there's any Q&A. And again, my mouse for some reason has seemed to disappear, but I see no questions. But there's my mouse, okay. <laughs> um, so before I get into 
where we are with the current budget and talking about the COVID-19 crisis and that impact it's having on current efforts to reform state need-based financial aid, I do want to take a moment to talk about um, the wins that we've had over the last almost decade. I realize this slide is a little bit dense, but the main takeaway is that since 2011-12 budget year, we have had some really great wins and with our coalition forming in 2012, I, you know, I really feel very strongly that we would not have had these wins without the great work of our affordability coalition, which includes strong leadership from FSCCC and the other statewide student leadership groups. So I want to just take a moment to thank all of you and, and your colleagues for the great work that you have and continue to do to strengthen college affordability in our state. Um, but the main takeaway from this slide is that over the last decade, we have um, both advocated successfully for increases to the Cal Grant B Access Award, as well as increasing the number of competitive Cal Grants that are available every year. In fact, last year's budget, 2019-2020, we had the largest ever increase to the number of annually available competitive Cal Grants. And um, we also were succeeded in allowing um, eligible undocumented students to compete for them on equal footing as their documented peers, which is great. So we went from the previous year where there were 20, just under 26,000 available awards to now 41,000 and also allowing our undocumented peers to um, uh, apply and compete for competitive awards as well. Um, we have also seen some movement in holding colleges accountable. So um, this doesn't really apply to the community colleges. This is more about issues with for-profit colleges, but um, essentially in addition to there being eligibility requirements for students, we also want to make sure that um, there's eligibility requirements for the schools themselves, that they're providing, um, you know, adequate educations, and that's measured by um, how many students default on their federal loans, as well as ensuring that there's a minimum graduation rate. In addition to the work of Californians for College Affordability, I also want to give a huge shout out to the six financial aid cam campaigns um, that's been led uh, by the SSCCC, CSSA, and UCSA. Um, I just feel really grateful to be able to work with all of you and your fellow leaders to raise awareness in the capital around the college affordability challenges that our students are facing. And I know that things are um, uncertain right now with the COVID-19 crisis, which again, I'll talk a little bit about in a couple slides, but did want to pause just to give um, a shout out to this coalition as well. So again, I'll take a quick pause and see if there's any Q&A and do not see any. So continuing to move on. Now I've talked about <coughs> the college affordability landscape um, I have talked about the work of our coalition and the fixed financial aid campaign, which both of which really focus a lot on um, both expanding the number of lower income Californians who get financial aid as well as the amount. But in the past two years or so, there's been growing consensus around a California affordability pledge. And what that looks like is that in an ideal world, there would be a, an affordability pledge where students would be expected to contribute a reasonable amount from work and or borrowing loans. Parents would be expected to pay a reasonable amount based on their own ability to pay. And of course, that would only apply to dependent, not independent students. And then the remainder would um, be covered with grants and scholarships, so, um, uh, some combination of federal state and institutional aid. So TCAS has been involved in ongoing efforts to reform the state Cal Grant program to get as close to an affordability pledge as possible. And we, um, the most recent efforts on this front, uh, we, and throughout 2019, TCAS held a financial aid reform work group that included representation from all three of the statewide student leadership groups, super important. Um, to have make sure that the student voices are at the forefront of these reform efforts. Nobody knows better than 
all of you what um, are the most severe challenges you're facing and um, you know helping to identify solutions to to ameliorate them and then so our work group com uh, concluded this past October and that month we also held a financial aid reform convening in Sacramento and released a report which you can find on our site charting the course for redesigning financial aid in California Around that same time, California Student Aid Commission convened, and then they have recently concluded their financial aid working group, which included TCAS and other college affordability stakeholders, including student leadership, to build on those ongoing efforts. And then they put together their recommendations in their Cal Grant modernization proposal, which they released uh, in February. Now, things had been moving um, in the direction of Cal Grant reform, which is incredibly exciting. Um, you know, I think that the groundwork that our coalitions had laid over the last decade really uh, increased awareness around total college costs, that it's not just tuition and fees, and that um, there are also all of the really important work that's done around been, been done around basic needs and security and how so many of our students are suffering and not having adequate um, access to um, nutritious food and safe and consistent housing, all of that had led to um, these re reform efforts. Now, it's unclear at the moment what will happen with them given the COVID-19 crisis that we're facing and its impact on the economy uh, and all of, you know, in addition to um, uh, it's looking like there's going to be a lot less money available in this budget than was anticipated before the crisis. Of course, there's also the issue of needing resources to be diverted um, for health, health um, care and, and such. All of that said, I do hope um, and have faith that we will um, be able to continue these financial aid reform efforts. Um, and I'll be happy to make sure that I share information with all of you as, as I learn more. But in the interim, I did want to talk about some of the work that we are doing to ensure that amidst this ongoing worldwide pandemic, um, we are able to help protect our students' financial aid. So I just wanted to talk a couple minutes about what we're doing there. So again, I'm just going to pause to see if anyone has any questions about the reform work. And it seems like there are none. So I will continue. Um, <clears throat> so at the end of March, um, uh, President Trump passed the federal, or no, I'm sorry, signed into law the Federal CARES Act, which includes several provisions around federal financial aid. Um, and so we at TCAS are looking at how we can provide, um, how we can you know, advise the California State Legislature to enact some similar provisions to help um, protect state and institutional financial aid. So for example, in the Federal CARES Act, there's a provision around the Pell Grant and um, you may have heard of something called return to Title IV, which essentially means that if you get finan federal financial aid and then you withdraw in the middle of a term, the school is on the hook for getting that money, that grant money back from you to return to the federal government. So one of the provisions in this federal legislation that was just signed into law is that if you withdraw from a course during the COVID-19 pandemic or because of it, um, you're not gonna be required to pay your Pell Grant back. Um, there's also another provision that has to do with lifetime eligibility limits. So uh, you can only get up to 12 full-time semesters of Pell Grant. Um, however, if you, um, they're not going to count against your lifetime eligibility limit for Pell if it, it, terms that occur during this crisis. So again, um, we wanted to think, you know, are there parallel ways we can address this in California? So one is wanting to make sure that for state and institutional aid and Cal grants that we're not going to be um, asking students to repay any portion of their grant aid if they have to withdraw during COVID-19 affected terms. Similarly, not wanting to have to count for those aid programs like Cal grants where there are lifetime limits, four years for Cal grants, not counting those terms affected by this crisis towards the, the four-year total. 
There's also the issue that several grant programs, including Cal Grants, have merit requirements and almost all have what we call SAP or satisfactory academic progress requirements where students are required to show that they are both maintaining a minimum GPA and also um, that they are completing a certain share of attempted courses. And so um, for both of those issues, um, you know, we wanna do some work to, to ho hopefully ensure that there are, um, number one, schools are able to have alternative ways of documenting merit for students who may not be able, they may not have grades from this term or their grades might be affected because of the crisis. And then also just wanting to make sure that satisfactory academic progress calculations are not impacted by students um, um, withdrawing during these COVID-19 affected terms. And then a couple other provisions have to do um, with uh, interruptions in student enrollment. We want to, uh, we, you know, for certain programs like Cal Grants, there are already allowances to, for, for recipients to put their awards on hold. Um, but we do want to make sure that um, during these uh, COVID affected terms, oops, sorry, just skipped ahead unintentionally. During these COVID affected terms that students are not cutting into their, um, um, you know, the, the clock in terms of how long they're able to have in interruptions in their um, enrollment. And then also to the extent that one-time funding is available, um, wanting to ensure that there's emergency grant aid available in particular for undocumented students. The Federal CARES Act legislation that I just mentioned that was passed um, late last month provides um, quite a su substantial amount of funding to colleges to provide to their students for um, emergency financial aid. However, one thing that's unclear right now is whether or not those these school, our schools are gonna be able to use those federal dollars to help undocumented students. And um, that's because uh, currently um, uh, undocumented students are not able to, are not eligible for federal financial aid. So we wanna make sure that if that is indeed the case and if they can't give, if schools cannot give emergency grant aid to students from the federal dollars that there are state dollars available. Again, we're not sure yet if that is the case, but just want to um, uh, make sure there's, that there is, um, you know, resources for our undocumented students. And also, we anticipate that financial aid administrators are going to, you know, they already have quite heavy workloads, especially at community colleges where there's fewer dollars per student than there are in the other segments, and that many students are likely going to um, be asking for professional judgments, which are already allowed under current law um, to, you know, normally when you fill out the FAFSA, you're using um, tax data from a previous year. But of course, many people, including, you know, my own friends and family have already, you know, lost their jobs recently. And so, um, you know, if your FAFSA may include income um, from last year, which is no longer um, applicable. So we want to make sure that um, there's enough um, financially administrators available working enough hours to help our students do these different um, adjustments to their applications so that everyone gets as much um, financial aid as they're eligible for. So I just, again, I want to just pause for a moment and check and see if we have any questions. And we will also have Q&A open at the end as well. Not seeing anything at the moment. <clears throat> so in terms of opportunities for advocacy and collaboration, um, you know, I always love working so much with student leaders like yourselves. Um, it's really the perfect combination to have the data that we crunch <laughs> um, paired with the compelling stories of the affordability challenges that you and your peers face. And so just in general, not, not even just during this you know, ongoing crisis, but in general, it's always incredibly helpful when you're able to um, reach out to your legislators and caucus, ethnic caucus members, um, not just in Sacramento, although that's terrific, but also in their district offices. Also, you know, writing letters to the editor of California and also college newspapers, coming to Sacramento and when they're available and they're in the district, um, here, you know, testifying at hearings, and there's the legislative hearings for bills and then the budget hearings for the budget. Of course, uh, involving others in the community and spreading the word through social media. Um, and partnering with us at PICUS and our Coalition of Californians for College Affordability. So uh, in general, you know, really love working with all of you and 
I also wanted to talk about some specific campaigns that we have done in the past, and then I will um, pause for our final Q&A. So <clears throat> um, last spring, uh, I worked on a resolution with SSCCC on um, ensuring that our community college students have the supports that they need um, to be successful college students. So just wanted to flag that um, just in terms of working together, this is one way that we have done that in the past. And actually, I just saw a question come in. So um, someone asked, for the opportunities and collaboration, who do I contact to get started? And please contact me. My email will be at the end of the PowerPoint. It's uh, laura at tkis.org, but I, you'll see it in just a couple slides. And so glad that there's already interest. Actually, I can type the answer, so I will let me type it right here. I'm still getting familiar <laughs> with all the technology here. Um, okay, I also wanted to talk about some postcard campaigns that um, we have done in the past. So back in 2017, we worked with the California with the sorry the student senate for California community colleges to uh, on a postcard campaign where um, different um, uh, board members and state senators uh, student senators um, took postcards back to um, their constituents and their students we had them fill out why it's important to invest in more competitive Cal grants and it was amazing um, working with SS triple C we got more than 2,000 responses we then took these postcards with student stories and delivered them to legislative leadership um, and just to illustrate how these efforts really are important speaker anthony rendon wrote a piece in the huffington post after this campaign and this is a quote from from his op-ed where he said while the success stories of these students are very real so are the struggles that so many other students face despite financial aid programs Many still struggle with costs associated with buying textbooks, affording transportation to school, and other day-to-day -day living expenses. So again, this is, you know, um, this just illustrates how um, our efforts working together um, are seen by key legislative leaders and contribute to um, the wins that we've had in the past. Now, some of you may have seen this other postcard. Um, I was working specifically with Amin and Danny um, and some other leaders investing in California's future must start now. Californians need affordable college. Um, and I just wanted to say that because of the current situation where we're not with social distancing and where we're unable to um, go out in the field and go out to students and get their stories, we are, we at TICUS are working on um, figuring out how we can move this to an electronic campaign. So please stay tuned for that and um, we will make sure that the information gets out to all of you. So um, just to kind of give a summary of um, what we are um, you know, looking for in terms of a much stronger, more equitable, meaningful financial aid system in California. We want uh, the system that works better for students in the state. We want to, you know, really point out the challenges that our students are facing today are a direct result of the ways in which the Cal Grant program has been underfunded over the years. You know, um, at this, you know, incremental reforms do add up. So I want to say again, um, it's been so wonderful to have SSCCC and other student leaders help us in our efforts over the years. And, you know, as I mentioned, we have seen, you know, last year the largest ever increase in the number of competitive Cal Grants. We've seen the access award go up a couple hundred dollars, but again, we're still very far from where we need to be. And that while we continue to work together to reform state need-based financial aid, there are steps that California can take right now to protect our students' access to financial aid amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, I want to thank all of you for joining today. And we still have um, a couple, you know, 15 minutes or so left. So I wanted to open it up and see if there are um, any additional questions. Now, Angelique, should folks, um, oops, 
gosh, I'm not quite sure. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, two things. So number one, you'll see here my email address, laura at tkif.org. So please feel free to reach out to me. And then Angelique, should people continue to write any questions they have in or is there a way for people to ask verbally? Um, I don't think people can ask verbally. They're going to have to type it in. Just okay, no problem. Our session. Um, I do have a quick question. Sure. For, for students. I mean, how else can they get their stories out to, you know, their respective uh, representative in their own district? Is there a quick link for them to find out who is their rep and how they can send in their stories? Should they send in their stories to their own representatives or uh, just to work in collaboration with TKIS and SSCCC in our coalition? Yeah, so um, there, uh, stay tuned for, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still trying to flesh out um, what an electronic process would look like for students sharing stories right now. So I think that the best way is if, if it's something that you're interested in um, participating in to shoot me an email, and then I can just make sure that um, once we have our plan figured out that um, we can uh, send that to you and that also <clears throat> there are um, I just got a great link from uh, Gerson um, which I think it was from Gerson um, which is uh, I don't think everyone can see it too find your rep dot legislature dot ca dot gov and it looks like that went out to everybody so thank you so much for sharing that that's also a way that you can figure out who your representatives are right thank you And I'm happy to just wait um, a couple more minutes and see if folks, I know we still have folks on the line. So um, happy to just hang on here in case people have any additional questions. You're also, you're always welcome to follow up with me uh, over email. And we can also try to find a time to talk on the phone if that is helpful as well. So uh, feel free to um, to drop off if, if you have other things you need to do. Otherwise, I'll just wait a couple more minutes. But again, really appreciate all of the great work that you and your colleagues are doing. I'll just wait one more minute because it looks like most folks have dropped off, but I just want to make sure that for those who are still on, um, if they had other questions they want to ask. Okay, well, I think that that it looks like most people have have, uh, have closed off. So again, a final thank you and please do email me um, if you have interest in learning more or participating in our advocacy efforts and let's look forward to connecting again soon.